sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Glory be to 
thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord, our heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, <coughs> mercy upon us, that takest away the minds of the faithful to be of one will. Grant unto thy people that they may love what thou commandest and desire what thou dost promise, that among the manifold changes of this world our hearts may there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. O God, who causes wars to cease to the ends of the earth, forgive us our godlessness and hatred, Hear our prayers on behalf of all who suffer at the hands of aggressors, and grant an end to all strife, so that thy people may worship thee in peace, and call others to Christ in freedom, through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on Cantate Sunday is recorded for us in the prophecy given through St. Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah prophesied at the command of the Lord, saying, In that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day, you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Here ends the lesson. We sing responsively Psalm 182 as printed in the bulletin. Yeah. 
in the congregation of the mighty. He judges all of the gods. epistle appointed for this day is recorded for us in the letter of St. James, beginning in chapter 1 at the 16th verse and reading through verse 21. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Here ends the Holy Epistle. Please arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. John, beginning in chapter 16 at the fifth verse. Jesus taught his disciples and said, Now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. 
It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said he will take of mine and declare it to you. Here ends the Holy Gospel. Today we confess the holy Christian faith we have just heard according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified by dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. 
Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Dear fellow redeemed, by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God who went away to the Father in sacrifice and returned on account of our justification, grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance. From God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear once again the words of the epistle lesson, James chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Let us pray. And so now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I, uh, didn't write this down on the manuscript, but I had actually intended to use the prayer uh, that we use at Vespers, the Collect for Peace, which talks about, here, let me read that to you because now I don't have it in my mind. Um, and I had forgotten to make a note of that. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that we, being defended by thee from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who liveth, etc. I think that prayer, that collect, is just spot on for our general meditation this Sunday. And James, in our epistle lesson, presents the gospel as that great equalizer. If you read the words that precede our pericope, our cutting of the text, you see James talking about how the humble person should glory in his exaltation and the rich man should glory in his humility. Because the gospel levels the playing field. And one of the things I try to do is I, you know, grab a cup of coffee between the fogginess of crawling out of bed and the scrambling of trying to get to Bible class on time uh, is to read the current news. And this morning, there's a news event, and I suppose just about any Sunday morning there's some news event that fits very well with what we're thinking about. But there was a shooting in New York over the weekend where 10 people were murdered by a man who apparently, from what we know so far, was doing this uh, because he hated a race of people, overly loved his own race, perhaps was maybe frustrated with things that were going on in his own life. And we think about the words in this reading, the wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. It is the Christian who is raised up from the dust of despair and told, you know what? Jesus calls you brother and sister. Jesus has adopted you into the family of God such that you are royalty. You are a prince or a princess. This is absolutely true. Or the words of our psalm, are, are you not astonished that God calls you gods? Is that not astonishing to you? And that psalm could absolutely substitute for, um, for our lesson that we're meditating on this morning and, and the words that precede it. 
Because not only are you gods, not only are you royalty, not only are you brothers and sisters of the great emperor, the king of kings, the king of kings, the one who is God himself calls you brother and sister. Wow. If you sometimes struggle with not feeling like you have value in this world and being frustrated with everything you see going on and being treated by the culture as someone who not only merely doesn't matter, but somebody who is to be attacked and pushed aside and rejected and hated on because you are whatever it is you are. You're a brother or sister of Christ. You're a member of the royal family indeed. You are a God. You are not the God. So let the rich person glory in his humility, which in the words of the psalm, of course, are, you will die like men. You will fall like one of the princes. You may have it really good in this world. Everything may be going more than swimmingly for you. You may have such an abundance of material blessings, and on the one hand, one would argue that anybody living in the United States of America has an abundance of material blessings. You may have it so good, but understand, James says prior to this text, you're like the flowers of the field that very quickly die off and are no more. Ouch. And in the context of that equalizing thought, and understand that what that does for us, understand what that would have done for that man who went and murdered 10 people this weekend. That it would put everyone on an equal basis with him. He is certainly no worse than anyone else. A sinful creature needing salvation just like everybody else, needing forgiveness on a daily basis and no better than anyone else because he is not going to get out of this world alive either short of the return of our Savior in glory when he himself along with everyone else will be judged and in that context of you and me and every other human being being brought to the ultimate level playing field the gospel just takes it all away from us on the one hand and gives us everything on the other. In that context, St. James says, don't be deceived. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from heaven. From the Father of lights, from the one who is the ultimate stability in a chaotic world. I mean, the values of today are going to be radically different tomorrow. Cultural values, what people consider to be moral and immoral, changes with increasing rapidity as history goes on, doesn't it? I mean, truly, if you study history at all and you look at the values that people had, century ago, 500 years ago, a millennia ago, several thousand years ago. The values do change, but God doesn't change. Even when we think about how the Christian church worships, it stays remarkably consistent among those who are sacramental and liturgical. Why? Well, the sinfulness of human beings has not changed one bit. God hasn't changed one bit. The way of salvation hasn't changed one bit. And as we gather together and reflect, what we see in the scriptures is indicated to us as being good and acceptable worship. I mean, it's not that hard to see what it looks like. You just read the Bible, right? We continue to do these same things in a world where the values change in the culture. 
but God hasn't changed. And he remains the judge. And James tells us the good gifts, the perfect gifts, come down from heaven. They come from him. And as we focus on this lesson today, we are come, supposed to come away with the idea of that perfect gift being the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that greatest gift from God the Father who works faith in our hearts by the implanted word. You became a child of God, adopted into his family, made a brother or sister of your Lord Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism, that rebirth through the womb of your mother, the Holy Christian Church, by the word of God. Because the water that's used there in and of itself is just water. But when it is connected to the command and the promise of God and the name of God. It gives you a new identity. You become a part of a new family. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit through that word. And St. James encourages us to receive that word. Notice you are now asked to be active in receiving that word which already is implanted in you. Hold on to it. Think about it. Talk about it indeed. Sing about it. Dear Christians, one and all, rejoice with exaltation singing because God has given you the greatest of gifts in the face of seemingly hopelessness and sorrow. God has promised you the resurrection from the dead. And indeed, you yourself are a kind of first fruits of the resurrection from the dead because you, through the waters of baptism, have already been raised to new life in Christ. Eternal life is yours now. Eternal life is in you now. You are now alive forever and though your body may expire at some point eternal life remains yours so that if and when your body gives out it's just a time for your body to rest for a little while until our savior comes and calls you out of the grave every human being will rise from their graves one day you have already risen from eternal death. So the second death of being separated from Christ eternally in the pain and suffering of eternal hell, well, that can't touch you because you have already experienced the first resurrection. You have been put to death for your sins with Christ through the waters of baptism, so connected with him that God views you as having died for your sins and you in faith have already risen to eternal life. So resting in the grave is okay. And the idea of rising from the grave is also okay because you will rise to eternal joy with your Savior God, the one who cares about you so deeply that he entered his own creation to become one of us, to suffer and die for our sins, our hatred, our conceit, our despair, our lack of understanding, our godlessness died for that, suffered the punishment for that, so that you and I can look forward to a resurrection where we hear the beautiful words, nice job, well done. Enter into the rest prepared for you. You, in my eyes, are not guilty. Oh, but those those who have not received that gift that comes down from heaven, from the one who
who does not change. There's not even a hint of change in him. He's not ambivalent. He's not going back and forth. He's not wishy-washy. He remains firm. The idea of standing before him when you don't want to be around him, boy, that's a scary thought. Kind of like the people on Pentecost who heard Peter say, you did it. You killed him. God has raised him. Oh boy, that's a scary thought. But by God's grace, many continue to hear that his death at our hands was for our good and that even the curses we would call down upon ourselves, God is able in his wisdom, in his incredible power to turn a curse into a blessing that to have the blood of Jesus on us would not serve to destroy us, but serve to present us before the Father as ones who are holy, redeemed, and sanctified by his blood. And so perhaps James makes a little distinction here in what he writes to us between good gifts that come down from heaven and perfect gifts that come down from heaven. Maybe, and I don't want to push this too hard, but maybe we should think about this. Is there a difference between the good gifts that come from heaven and the perfect gifts that come from heaven? If we are to make a distinction between the two, perhaps it's this. The good gifts, are not so much the material things, but the fact that you have faith in the here and now. And you are called upon to bear up patiently. Because when we suffer difficulties in this life, God is refining us and he's reaching out to others through us. And so if we become angry and impatient and rebel and say, God, I don't want this. This is not fair. How can a loving God do all of this? And, and truly, we feel these things at times, don't we? And the book of Jonah? The book of Jonah is not so much a story about somebody being swallowed by a large sea creature, but it's the account of a servant of God who's not happy with God. He's mad at God. Go back and read this. When you feel angry with God, when you feel God isn't being fair, go back and read those few, those four short chapters and look at how God dealt with his servant, who he told to go and do something, and the man, oh, was a bigot. He knew that God was going to be merciful to a certain group of people if he went and preached God's wrath to them, that they might likely repent and God would forgive them, and he didn't want that for them, almost like a guy who would put on body armor and take a gun and shoot 10 people at a grocery store and kill them. Not very different, is it? And how did God deal with him? Well, he leveled the playing field, didn't he? He brought Jonah down. You think you somehow are worth more than all of these people? Even the animals that are there. You think somehow that I should care about you and not them? Who do you think you are? And every step of the way, the book is saying God provided, God provided, God provided, God provided. And it's not just Jonah, but that's the focus, right? God provides for him a boat, a storm, a sea creature, a people to preach to, a scorching sun and a hot east wind, and a vine to grow up to give him shade and provides that the vine dies and provides an incredible example. But he provided for the people of Nineveh as well this faithless minister. That's what the preachers of God are like. Yeah, that's right. They're sinful human beings. The focus is not them. The focus is the God who sends them to do what he commands them to do and speak what he commands them to speak. That's the focus. God provided that weak one to preach his very effective word, which bore effective fruit. 
not only in Nineveh, but for those men on the boat who suffered because God's servant was unfaithful. Wow. To the result that they came to faith. So how many of us, if we have a diagnosis of cancer, and the doctor says, okay, I'm going to give you some medicine that's going to really suppress your health so bad that you're going to feel like you're dead. It's going to be really rough for the next eight, you know, X number of months as you go through taking this medicine or this treatment. It's going to be horrible. But the end result is we're going to kill the cancer and you're going to live. And we go through it. And we think it is somehow worthwhile to sacrifice X number of months of our lives feeling like we're dead, oftentimes wishing we were dead, to kill something that's killing us so that we can live. Take the lesson to the spiritual realm where God, in all of the things that you experience, when he asks you, patiently endure, look to me, cry out to me, tell me when you've gotten to the point, God, I can't take it anymore. I just can't, I just can't do it. You told me you won't give me too much. You either lighten the burden or you give me the strength. It's got to be one or the other because I, I, just, I just can't do it anymore. Cry out to him. And understand what he's doing in your life. He is treating the sin in you. He is working to reach the people around you through you. Is it hard? Yes, it is. But what comes after the suffering is life, eternal life. And like the person who makes it through the chemotherapy or the radiation treatment or whatever it is, and they come out and they're okay, you rejoice. And you don't meditate on the suffering you went through. You go, glad that's over. And you move on in a life of gratitude and joy, looking at the life you have as being that much more sweet and treating the people around you that much more tenderly. The wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Your anger over your suffering does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Your anger at the people around you who cause you to suffer does not accomplish the righteousness of God. But God calls you to be an instrument of his salvation. <clears throat> And we see the example of our Savior who suffered so much at our hands, so many indignities, and it was entirely and completely not fair. He did this so that you and I can be received as the children of God and spend an eternity free from suffering. And he says, now, I would like you to be the one that patiently endures that receives the rage of the one who's screaming in anger over whatever perceived injustice they may think they're experiencing and wait for the opportunity when you might calmly and lovingly show what it means that there is a God in heaven who loves even the one who is raging so badly that they can't hear anything. And sometimes it takes time we have the promise that there is a perfect gift. We have the good gift now of faith, the good gift now of receiving the gospel in the preached word, the good gift now of the waters of baptism that make us a part of God's family, the good gift now in which Jesus lovingly gives himself to us that we might have holiness working in us from the inside out, that we can view everybody else as on the same level needing to receive holiness. We have the good gift now. And there's a perfect gift. When Christ returns in glory and remakes everything, and there will be no more suffering for those who are in Christ ever 
ever, ever again. And so as we get ready to focus very specifically on praying that the Lord would give us the gift of the Holy Spirit and we focus on that in the time of Pentecost, but we focus on it all throughout the year, don't we? We step back and we think, what do I need most from God as I try and continue on in this world and I look forward to that perfect gift that he has for me? I need his spirit who sometimes prays on my behalf when I don't even have the words to say, but I just get on my knees and shed my tears and ask that God would have mercy. And God has had mercy. Our Savior went away to the Father, paid for our sin so that we could be holy, so that he could send the Holy Spirit to us and the Spirit would be received through the implanted word and we would be counted the children of God, that we would be numbered among the gods, living eternally, ruling over God's creation in purity forever. Amen. Christ is risen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Please arise for the blessing. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. The offertory today is hymn 189. desires to become a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, being fully convinced that in this church the Word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and the sacraments administered according to their institution by Christ. So if you would turn to Moyen at this point, I therefore ask you, Scott, in the presence of God and this congregation, do you acknowledge and confess the teachings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church to be the true and unaltered teachings of the Word of God? If so, declare so by saying, I do. I do. Do you therefore desire, in sincere obedience to God, to be received by us into the communion of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and of this congregation? If so, declare so by saying, I do. I do. Do you intend to commin continue in the confession of this church, to make diligent use of the means of grace, and to lead a sober, righteous, and godly life, even unto the end. If so, declare so by saying, I do so intend with the help of God. I do so intend with the help of God. Upon this your promise, I, in the name of this congregation, give to you the right hand of fellowship and love, acknowledging you as a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, 
and inviting you to join us in the reception of the Lord's Supper and to participate in all the other blessings of salvation which God has given to his church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, enabling you to receive the truth in the love of it, and to do the will of God from the heart, and keeping you unto his kingdom and glory. Amen. You may return to your seat. Peace be with you. Amen. Let us arise and pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give you most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee especially that thou hast preserved unto us in their purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto thy holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we, in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians, fight the good fight of faith and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth. Especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, war and pestilence, scarcity and famine, protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling, and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow, the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless the nation of Ukraine and drive out the invader, that you would grant peace to them, that they may worship you in peace and that they may tell others of you in freedom. Grant that all godly people are able to bear up and not be drawn into hatred, but that they would act in love whenever the opportunity presents itself while at the same time defending their land and their homes. We pray that you would continue to bless all who receive refugees, that they may be blessed by the presence of those whom they have received into their homes. We also pray that you would continue to bless Hunter Copley as he continues to recover and grow stronger from his surgery, that you would grant him a full and complete recovery if you are willing. And as we are all strangers and pilgrims on earth, Help us by true faith and the godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night cometh when no man can work, and when our last hour shall come. Support us by thy power, and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost, be with you all. Amen.